Elgers of Browning. And um, I always get the, the honor of introducing her because she is just absolutely an amazing woman. Um, Carol um, is the wife of Dr. James Browning, um, who I, th I think is, I think I saw him log on a minute ago. Um, but Carol um, is easily one of the most brilliant women that I've ever met um, and really changed my life uh, when it came to biblical studies. Um, and to just, she really instilled a passion for learning in her classroom. So she is a um, professor emeritus here at the University of Pikeville, and she was an advisor to our academic team, and she published several scholarly articles, including Kingship in Israel um, with Marvin Tate in the Mercer Dictionary of the Bible, and the study notes on First and Second Samuel in the New Interpreter Study Bible, and Life, the Universe, and Everything, Medieval Spanish Judaism, dealing with Aristotle and sacred texts. Unfortunately, um, she had to retire due to illness um, after she had taught for 23 years. She retired in 2011, and that was my last year in undergrad. Um, so Carol, um, her legacy has had a major, major impact on her students. Uh, she was an excellent communicator who found a way to make her wisdom applicable to, to until today. Um, to quote from her, her husband, um, I've known her as the brightest person I've ever met, very sharp-witted, <laughs> um, and she always had this super engaging way um, to approach her lectures, very funny. Um, it always makes me sad when I have students that come through our university now that never got the chance to have her in class because she was just so amazing, such an amazing educator. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, other people have said, as a genuine person and a teacher, she was as genuine a person and teacher as they've ever met. Carol always shared something special with her students, and that was herself. It's very clear that in the time that she lectured, she taught very much from her heart. Her passion for that subject with students was completely unquestionable. So inside and outside the classroom, Dr. Grizzly Browning sincerely expressed interest in her students, and many people have personally benefited from that caring spirit and words of wisdom and encouragement. So we thank you so much for being part of this lecture series today. It means a lot to us um, in the history of our institution and to honor Carol. Absolutely. And we know that Carol, as uh, a feminist Old Testament scholar, um, if she was able to engage with us tonight, she would be so excited to have another uh, Old Testament uh, feminist scholar in the midst uh, sharing with our students. And uh, here, and I hope this picture was okay for you. Um, I just pulled it right off your website. Um, <laughs> And um, very accomplished. You bring a lot of accomplishments to the table tonight um, with your great work, but I suspect that some of your greatest work happens in the classroom that only your students see, um, because you also are a dean of students, which I don't know how you balance both of those things. Um, but our guest tonight, you can look at all the qualifications that she brings, um, and you were the first professional in, endowed uh, professor at your seminary, is that correct? Yes, and at this point I may be the only one. Well, that, that, may, that must make your development people very happy for your accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but backgrounds include the Hebrew Bible, of course, sexuality in the Hebrew Bible, post-colonial interpretation, womenist and feminist interpretation, a PhD from Emory. Um, you've been on faculty since 1995 at Hood. Um, uh, participating in the African Biblical Hermeneutics section of the Society of Biblical Literature. Uh, you are an Anglican Episcopal and uh, recently involved with the Feminist Biblical Studies in Africa work. Um, but also I was really taken by your community involvement, community service on the Board of Rape, Child and Family Abuse Crisis uh, Council in your area. So I wanted to say thank you for not only being a scholar, being involved in students' lives, uh, but really being involved in your community. That is a, a huge um, a model to me and to others. So we appreciate that you're doing the work. So uh, without further ado, thank you so much for being a guest at the University of Pikeville. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much. And um, my, uh, my appreciation for I don't know how you came across me, but, but I, I, I appreciate the honor of um, 
uh, being a speaker tonight and, and, and for something that recognizes uh, Dr. Browning. So I am, I appreciate that so much. Um, so I'm going to try, and I don't think it will be a long presentation, um, but I want to start by talking a little bit about, uh, so I just had the topic that you put on the, on the talk, on the invitation, uh, Bible through African eyes, exploring uh, African biblical hermeneutics. So I want to start by giving a small brief definition or yeah, definition or elements of African biblical hermeneutics. So engagement between the biblical text and the African context is fundamental to African biblical hermeneutics. So from the first encounter, the African reader of the Bible did not have the, the illusion of reading the Bible objectively as in Western biblical interpretation. The focus has never been on what it originally meant, but on what it means in the context of the reader. It is the, it is the same with uh, African biblical scholars who do not have the luxury to engage with the biblical text from a vacuum or supposedly neutral stance. Thus the African biblical scholars bring the experiences, challenges and ingenuities of the African experiences to bear on their theory and praxis of, of biblical hermeneutics. And as um, Teresa Okure aptly states, our contemporary life experiences are not only a valid standpoint for understanding the biblical text, they are the only standpoint we have. Experience is the primary context for doing theology and reading the Bible. Experience here is not feeling, but total immersion in life, being seasoned by life. So in the African context, the Bible is not an ancient document that is largely mined for its historical and moral value with implications for the present remain, with, with implications for the present remaining implicit. For Africans, the implications are made explicit. Thus, in African biblical hermeneutics, the Bible is not dealt with simply as an ancient text, but it is engaged with to deal with present concerns, addressing issues uh, and resonance with African realities. So African biblical hermeneutics is not um, an elitist endeavor because the Bible is read with and within communities. And thus it seeks to uncover reading practices that include otherwise marginalized and excluded African voices and to argue, to argue with such voices and to argue why such voices should be heard. And as Adam um, suggests, African biblical hermeneutics is the principle of the interpretation of the Bible for transformation in Africa. Thus the context of the reading communities become very central in meaning making. So efforts are made to address issues arising from the encounter. Oh, I just did something, my thing went off. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh. I have to find my paper now. Yes. 
Sorry. No worries, it's 2020. These things happen. <laughs> okay. Oh, I got it now, but let me see. Okay. Yeah, I think I've done the right thing now. Um, and where was I? Yeah, so uh, the context of the reading communities become very central in um, mean making, meaning making. So efforts are made to address issues arising from the encounter between the, the Bible and the cultures of its readers. And as uh, Mbue concludes, African biblical hermeneutics is both innovative and reactionary as it stems from how the Bible was introduced to um, sub-Saharan Africa and the subsequent exclusion or marginalization of African voices in biblical scholarship. So I want to uh, look briefly at the history of the, uh, the Bible in Africa. So the history of the Bible in Africa, we might say predates the history of Christianity in Africa. The Hebrew Bible had been translated into Koine Greek by the second century BCE and the Christian Bible's prevalence is as old as the early church in North Africa. In sub-Saharan Africa, however, the Bible was a late come, but its, its entrance on the sub-Saharan context has made a deep and enduring impact on its cultural, political, and religious landscape. The Bible has been on the forefront of the Western world's engagement with Africans south of the Sahara. It has been one of the main tools of the colonization of sub-Saharan Africa. This interplay between the Bible and colonialism in the, African, in the African context is often expressed in the popular saying, which goes, and you may have heard this before, when the whites came to Africa, the Africans had the land and the whites had the Bible. The white said, let us close our eyes to pray. When we, the Africans, opened our eyes, they had the land and we had the Bible. So this means that the Bible is um, a tool in the struggle um, no, so the Bible is a true tool of colonialism. So uh, there is a so a missionary work of spreading Christianity is seen in the light of colonialism. That Christianity is the other side of colonialism. That they work hand in hand. But on the other hand, the Bible also became a tool in the struggle of the Africans to regain their land and dignity, especially against apartheid in South Africa. But the connection between the Bible and colonialism has influenced biblical interpretations in sub-Saharan Africa. And as um, Musa Dewe uh, aptly puts it, biblical interpretation in sub-Saharan Africa cannot be separated from politics, economics, and cultural identity of the past and present. Biblical interpretation in the African continent is thus intimately locked in the framework of the scramble for land, struggle for economic justice, and struggle for cultural survival. Biblical interpretation remains wedged between Western and African history of colonialism, struggle for independence, post-independence, and the globalization era. So 
uh, biblical interpretation is uh, a site for struggle. So missionaries position the Bible as an authoritative text, as an, an authoritative text in all aspects of African life, while at the same time not trusting Africans to interpret it for themselves. Missionaries and colonial churches anticipated a relationship of um, dependence where African believers were not expected to do their own thinking or provide independent leadership, a stance that was rejected by some Africans who escaped this colonial control as reflected in the formation of the so-called African independent churches or African indigenous churches. These churches rejected the missionary use of the Bible as a weapon against African cultural and religious identity. So following the footsteps of African independent churches, uh, early biblical scholarship was vested in showing the, the compatibility of African uh, and biblical cultures to counter the demonization of the African culture and religions. So when missionaries introduced Christianity to, Zim to Africa, it was um, a, a, a competition with the already existing religions of Africa and the culture of Africa. And the missionaries equated the um, their own Western cultures with uh, biblical culture. And, and thus uh, uh, mi missionaries saw the Bible as being against African culture. That African culture was, was not Christian, was barbaric and uncivilized. So African culture was demonized in the name of the Bible. And the African independent churches I talked about were the earliest ones uh, to realize that. And so African independent churches do not throw away African tradition, thinking and practices in their Christianity, in, in how they live as Christian people. So, so to go back to talk about, um, African biblical hermeneutics. So African biblical hermeneutics focuses on the present in contrast to the ancient. So it wants to make biblical interpretation relevant to present realities. So it seeks to uncover reading practices that include otherwise marginalized, I said this before, uh, African voices. So it's not an elitist kind of work. Um, okay, that's a bit. So I want to then uh, just jump to, <laughs> jump to talking about how African eyes are put on the Bible. So how African eyes are put on the Bible. Um, so the earliest and which continues even to today was uh, what we might call incalculation, inculturation or cultural hermeneutics. Inculturation or cultural hermeneutics. So in, this is focused on the issue whether or not African cultures and or religions are compatible with Christianity. And the issue is the translatability of biblical concept into African culture. Uh, although 
they are scholars who question the compatibility of some aspects of biblical and African concepts um, in, in people who see um, cultural hermeneutics, which is the use of the comparative approach that the, the African culture and the biblical culture are compared. So they seek to establish points of agreement between the Bible and African religions and cultures. So the agenda, uh, in the agenda, the, in this agenda, the issue of translation of the, Bible, of the biblical text is tangential because the focus are uh, most, mostly on cultural elements. So when missionaries came, they, um, <clears throat> they were introducing a, a concept of God that was not um, familiar <laughs> to, the, um, to the African context. And, and I want to use the, uh, the, the, the context of Southern Africa, which I'm more familiar with. Um, so, for the Bible, for the message of the gospel to be acceptable to Africans, it had to be put in a way that was translatable into the African culture, which began with the identity of the biblical God. So in Southern Africa, the missionaries first came, uh, they came in two phases, actually. The first one, they were not successful. This is when it was not, um, attached to colonialism, uh, but um, when they eventually came, they uh, introduced their biblical God and were at first reluctant to use African names for God because that would be uh, pagan. Um, but then, they switched <laughs> and in their translation of the Bible, they adopted the names of uh, the African names of God. So they adopted the African names of God for the biblical God. So that, uh, and then they introduced education which was limited to teaching Africans how to read the Bible in their own languages. So, <laughs> so they, um, they, so the Bible now was now talking about uh, the, the African gods. So for example, in my own country, the God is Mari. So when, when now I open the Bible, it will tell me that Mari created the world, you know, the heavens and the earth. And then in, a, in, in connection with that, they also then uh, dismissed the way Africans taught, talked about their God. So the African myths and folk tales and everything were then no longer authoritative. So the Bible was made the authority on African gods. And so that's why the Bible is the God, the, the Bible is the, the Bible of Africa. It really, there's no way I can tell Africans to get rid of the Bible. I tried it in one of the, um, our SPL um, meetings uh, of African biblical hermeneutics, because my argument is, uh, uh, the, uh, the Bible arguments or embolden African patriarchy that is oppressive to women and other minorities. But they, so many of the African biblical scholars are also ordained preachers. So they have something invested in the Bible, but that's a story for another time. So, so in, 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 um, in critiquing uh, the Bible, 
the in critical Bible translations, uh, the the incalculation, inculturation does not cross over to the quest for proper indigenous terms in the biblical text. So they, they, we also have an element of where biblical African terms were then co-opted to talk about um, biblical concepts. And, and so there was really a struggle because at the beginning, African, um, African religions and cultures were regarded as inferior and needing to measure up to the Bible supremacy. And so as it is articulated by Justin of Pong, in calculation, hermeneutics sees the, sees the Bible as a document of faith and therefore demands entry into it and sharing the faith of the biblical community expressed in the text. So various cultural and religious concepts are lifted up for comparison. For example, uh, Mafiko argues for the compatibility of the concept of the God of the fathers in the Hebrew Bible and African ancestors. Then uh, Tolibe compares the liberative role of the biblical Jesus and the Nanga, the indigenous healer in African religion. So this comparative approach seeks to establish continuity of concepts and practices between biblical and African cultures. And in the, the earliest, the fathers of biblical hermeneutics go, go way back where um, John Beatty, for example, sees African indigenous religions as the forerunner to biblical religion. Thus, pre-colonial religions of Africa were to be replaced by the full revelation of the gospel situated in the Bible. But in addition to that kind of um, comparison or culturation, inculturation, more importantly, it entails recognizing the African reality as an authentic beginning point in the Bible's interpretive process. So for example, Okpong analyzes the parable of the shrewd manager in Luke 16, this is one to 13, that conveys how, uh, his analysis conveys how poor African readers would understand the, the parable in the light of the oppressive debt on, econ on African economies. So there is a constructive dialogue between the cultures in the Bible and those of the reader. So uh, the Bible can be used to interrogate African cultures, but also African cultures can be used to, uh, to understand the biblical culture. Then I want to touch on biblical hermeneutics, liberation hermeneutics, that's the other lens, our African eyes on, on the Bible. And uh, here the Bible is read from the context of justice for the poor and oppressed. And um, this, this was uh, developing between 1960s and 1980s in South Africa in particular um, in relationship to apartheid, which uh, seems to have intensified during that period. So for exa example, uh, Alan Bozak, an uh, anti-apartheid preacher and leader of the Black Resistance Movement, while in jail for his activism, he wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation uh, titled Comfort and Protest in 1987. And he read uh, Revelation um, in relationship to his experience 
as a jailed victim of the apartheid system, which he equates to John the Seer's experience under the Romans. And he interprets liberation as radically anti-imperialist literature, which nevertheless calls for nonviolent resistance in the face of the state's aggression. So it's informing his, um, his uh, posture of, uh, of his, the reality that he's experiencing through apartheid that will inform how he, how he counters it, not by taking up arms, but by nonviolent resistance. Then the other aspect of liberation um, hermeneutics that I want to highlight is that which is uh, identified as reading with the ordinary, non-scholar readers. Um, if you remember, I said that um, but biblical interpretation in Africa is not an elitist uh, group or an elitist in, endeavor. It's not, um, it's not something that is very theoretical. It, now it's beginning to be more theoretical than we were at the beginning, but it was, it's, it starts with context, context of the reader and bringing the Bible uh, message uh, to bear on, on a on the context, especially in community. So for example, in, uh, in South Africa, there was, well, it's still there. There is a, there is um, a, like a, an increase of violence against women, um, which falls into their, murder, rape, and all that. So the book of the, the, the rape of Tamar is read with uh, ordinary non-scholarly readers um, with scholars in them. And this was um, mostly propagated. The, the most important person here who used it is, who spread, who developed it and then spread is, is um, Gerald West in South Africa at KwaZulu-Natal where they have the center. So it's, this is what is usually called contextual Bible studies, where the Bible is being read to change, to transform the community for the better. So, and so this is um, in the realm of uh, liberation hermeneutics. Then I want to highlight a little bit um, women's eyes on the Bible, <laughs> uh, African women's readings, which, um, which is done in several ways, but um, <clears throat> it is read from the context of African patriarchy, the oppression of women and other minority people so it's, it's read to, uh, as a source of empowerment for people, for women under oppression and to, to, uh, to be empowered to fight for liberation, their own liberation and liberation of others. And, um, but it also recognizes the, um, the patriarchy in the Bible itself. So it critiques, uh, while it, it might, they might see women, African women, especially um, uh, non, uh, the ordinary readers might see examples of women who, um, who, um, who express or yeah, express their experiences of oppression under African patriarchy uh, might see that, but they, they also see, especially uh, scholars, trained scholars, they also see the complicity and the use of the Bible by African males in the oppression of women 
and in this, um, and they they critique even biblical translations that have um, that have um, yeah biblical translations that are translated in ways in patriarchal ways and androcentric ways and then are interpreted in that way and so it then arguments the struggle of African women to get rid of patriarchal oppression because the missionaries in the Bible embolden it. So that's one aspect. Then lastly, um, I want to highlight the newest um, direction, which can be identified not as newest, but more, we have now more identified it and depressing it, but I think it has been there all along, which is post-colonial biblical interpretation, um, which for Africa uh, really started in the uh, 2000s and so goes up to the present. So it's still very new, we're still developing it and it's still exciting because there's still more to do. So this is, um, this stems from the recognition of the impact of colonialism on all major aspects of African life, on politics, religion, language, economics, culture, and the list can go on. And it's, continuing impact on society today. So in this area, um, post-colonial biblical interpretation seeks to expose the colonial project in all its forms and then decolonize the colonized or formally colonized. Reading the Bible so it involves reading the Bible in which imperialist strategies are confronted, exposed, and arrested by post-colonial subjects. So it, um, it fully recognizes the, um, how the Bible has been used as a colonial tool and then tries to counter that. And uh, I want to give the example of which I have hi highlighted above, but I want to give um, an example of by highlighting again, the area of Bible translations. So, which, which is very interesting to really realize. So when, um, when biblical scholars were studying the Bible, the scholars, they were studying it in the English, yes, and not, yeah. So, <laughs> so when they eventually, when, so started, when we started in around 2000, um, people started reading, you know, going back to find, you know, how uh, missionaries spoke about us and all that and how the Bible and, and actually it began as there was this, um, this is when the reader, the reading with the ordinary people started. So they would go into the villages and into the town, into the urban areas and gather, you know, women in particular to read the Bible together. And so women would bring their own, everyone brought their own Bible. And so your that's when, in that context, when they were reading with these uh, indeed vernacular Bibles, that's when they realized that some of the words uh, that the missionaries chose to translate biblical terms were just um, uh, a demonization of African religions. So for example, African ancestors, so, um, the words for African ancestors were the words that were being used to refer to uh, demons that needed to be cast out. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing to, to do to 
to critique is the uh, so in missionary evaluation of Bible translation um, uh, and in missiology, not missionary, missiology, like people like Lamin Sane uh, have um, elevated Bible translation as having preserved African terms for God and African um, uh, and, and made the, the Bible become African. So, but when you, when what happened with um, most African places, and I will give the example of my country, which is uh, different languages. Now we have major languages that have dialects in them. And so uh, the missionaries standardized the languages which means that the other languages were suppressed. And so the other dialects are suppressed and now people have to, to, um, to revive or to look for those other language because um, schools and um, yeah, schools where the ch children were taught, they were taught the standardized shown and not their own dialect, which meant that's the death of their own language. Because once the, the, the elders who speak it are gone, then you are left with the standardized language. And so, what, so this is the, what we talk about, about how it impacted languages, the politics and everything. So this is an, an ongoing, uh, exploration of looking at the Bible in African eyes. And I want to say, um, this is just probably one-sided from my perspective, yes, because if you're familiar with Africa, it's not um, homogeneous. It's, it's, um, it's very, um, diverse. So they are conservative views of the Bible that are very strong. And actually some of what uh, African biblical hermeneutics have to wrestle with is the, um, the importation um, of um, such elements as prosperity gospels, because with globalization, now it's being zoomed into their um, houses. And sometimes it's not even edited to remove the 800 numbers to send money. But, <laughs> but so, we are, so we wrestle with that and also wrestle with, um, with, um, with the, idea that said that that has brought about um homophobia and the use of the bible for that so we have to continue to find ways to talk about those elements and so that's why it's more about transforming um community rather than reading for luxury or for um, spiritual engagement only, but it actually uh, leads to tangible activism in society. I think I will stop with that. Well, that's, uh, you've given us so much to think about. I really appreciate the, I know we gave you a really, really big topic, right? It's like to do it all in 45 minutes is an impossible task. So you've given us little uh, pieces of all of this. Um, we're going to open it now for questions, but I wanted to follow up with something you had just were st starting to talk about, which I'm fascinated on. You talked about reading the Bible in you know communities in the here and now, um, but I, I think about word of faith, prosperity, mm -hmm. as you just were talking about. Would, would you say that the, the prosperity gospel that's seeking to be imported 
into Africa and then and that now many preachers are really gaining notoriety from. Is that another form of colonization by the West? Yes, it's another form of colonization by the West. And the problem is um, it's, it's, it's bringing in <laughs> problems into, into Africa. That is uh, because again, the environment is of poverty. And so the, the interpretation of wholeness that used to be the wholeness of the, um, of the community, the wholeness of the uh, whole body is now imported as individualism. You know, not community oriented anymore, but people are um, being exploited by these preachers who are now they, they, these are African preachers themselves who are now acting like the televangelists here. And then in Africa, then it is compounded with the poverty of um, even lack of medical care that if people are ill and there's the person who says, if you bring me, if you come give God money, God will heal you, you know, and, and all that. And if you are in poverty, if you want a house, you, you know, things like that, that don't make sense in the um, African context itself that was community oriented before. So now we are wanting to build our, each one her, his or her own castle. That's, that's very helpful, thank you. Are there other questions from um, our audience today? I am going to attempt to ask a question if he isn't screaming. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm working on my PhD and I'm studying um, rape and theology, how theology can help people heal from that. So you said a few interesting things. Um, one of the things that I have been thinking about is um, how, uh, you know, you mentioned colonialism and Christianity being used as a tool in that. Um, and then simultaneously being used as a way to liberate. Right? Um, and I, I've been thinking a lot about um, survivors uh, of rape and sexual violence um, at the hands of people who are involved in the church, maybe not necessarily clergy, but maybe church people, um, and how they can um, reimagine um, biblical text in a way that liberates as opposed to continue to oppress. And one of the things that you mentioned was image of God um, and how um, translation becomes a, a, a problem um, if the translation is used to, to continue to oppress and demonize and that sort of thing. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about um, the African image of God and how that, how um, translating image of God through the African context has um, helped to help to reimagine the text uh, as a liberative tool. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. <clears throat> well, I, I was actually, if you had image of God, that's not what I meant. <laughs> well, concept of God is different from image of God. So, yeah, but, but I want, I'm going to talk to you in relationship to concept of God. So the concept of God um, in originally, I'm gonna use my own context of Zimbabwe, of Shona. So God was spirit um, with no, <laughs> you know, transcendent from humanity and, um, and then it was compounded by that the African, my language doesn't distinguish whether or not you are talking about a man or a woman as language goes. Um, but when, when the Bible is then translated and Mari is made into, into uh, the biblical God, and then the surface reading of it that then goes, and then it is pushed and, and as you go along, because in Africa, God was 
introduced from the New Testament perspective so that um, God becomes God the Father who is male. And then uh, in addition to that, then um, only males are depicted as serving this God. And women are then uh, marginalized and disempowered. And the avenues, so, so African religions were that anyone could be a medium of the spirit of God, anyone. And so women were practitioners, women were uh, serving this God. And then you have the biblical, the Bible then that is introduced that says, no, Mary is now male and women can't be used for that. And, and then, so the, the form of patriarchy that is then, so you have now an intersection of Western patriarchy and African patriarchy and they get linked and African patriarch becomes biblical patriarch, which is authoritative. So the Bible is the word of God in Africa. There's no way you can take that away from people. So the, then, so which means, and some most men out there in the world and even women will then say, oh, African culture is good when it is oppressive. So I don't know if I'm answering your question. I know you want to know more about your, <laughs> about rape. <laughs> no, that's really helpful. Thank you. I want to thank you for your delightful and insightful presentation. Uh, I'm very interested in the ordinary reader approach. And I wonder if you would talk more about how one would practically implement that. I'm, I'm always mindful that I don't want to myself perpetuate an elitist view of biblical interpretation. I want my students to have their own voice you know, discover means of interpretation that are meaningful to them. So how would one go about implementing uh, a, uh, uh, an ordinary reader approach? Okay, that's very good. Actually, if you go to um, the KwaZulu Natal's website, they have the documents there and they have been developing it and adding more, but it is about um gathering together on the same level uh the the biblical scholar might be a facilitator uh, and facilitates a discussion by asking questions that people answer for themselves and it's done in groups and then you come back and share the same um, element. So it is, um, it is, let me think if I can still remember how it goes. It is uh, see, judge, act. So you, <laughs> you see what the text is saying, then you judge the text and your context. And then you act to change your context. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. I, I like that formula that you've given. I very much appreciate it. Other questions that people may have? I have a question about 
in, uh, the context of Zimbabwe, your home country, you know, yeah. you, you gave us the idea of reading the Bible through liberationist eyes. And, you know, when they're dealing with a person like Mugabe, it, how was the Bible used to, to address maybe some of the ideology that was posed by, you know, a regime? And did you see the Bible used for liberation under, under that? Or, or did, was it used to prop up? Well, it, the, the, <laughs> the Bible was mostly, oh, it's, I don't even know how to go about it. The Bible was, <laughs> was appropriated by Mugabe. And, um, and this was the, the sad part of, the sad part was that even the African indigenous people, leaders became uh, drawn into that. Uh, I think he, that Mugabe was, Mugabe and all the other people, the, the Mugabe system is not gone, he's still there because the person who is there is just like him or worse. But it's like, um, so the persecution of um, um, homosexuals was done in the name of Bible and culture. So the churches uh, will join with Mugabe on that. It, because even today, you know, like um, they were sharing with me that um, the people, Christians in Zimbabwe, some Christians in Zimbabwe, evangelicals in Zimbabwe, were praying for, um, <laughs> for Trump to win because he, he fights against homosexuality and abortion. And it's like, have you heard him speak? <laughs> Do you know how he characterize your kind of people? But that's, that's, the, that's the point that no, it was it, those who were, those who would use the Bible to confront the uh, oppression of Mugabe would be persecuted and put in jail and have to leave the country. So uh, that's the, the dilemma. So like my, um, when, when Mugabe was there, the Bishop of Harare, yeah, the church, the Anglican church became disarrayed because the bishop started supporting Mugabe and, to, and behaved just like Mugabe so that the church was divided. The, uh, the church had to reclaim, go to court, reclaim their churches after a long time and had to go through rituals of cleansing because of how they had been used. But that's the... The part of it that uh, the Bible can be co-opted for evil in Africa. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I, one last question before we finish out tonight, if, and unless somebody else has a question, was you gave us, you walked us through a little bit of the Luke sixteen passage of unjust manager. Would there be any other text that you would say would be a really good example of maybe uh, an African eyes would read very differently than oftentimes, you know, Americans in the West may read, interpret, apply, and say, oh, this is the plain reading of it. Maybe an African would say, wait, I see this very differently. I would like to say um, the, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, the Lord's Prayer can be uh, it can be read differently from an African perspective, where it's about survival, about um, survival, uh, <clears throat> because the um, it's like get me to survive this day. So it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not, it's not so much spiritual, but it's, it's someone who is really <laughs> under threat of dying from poverty. 
um, of um, yeah of dying from disease um, that cannot be that they cannot they, they cannot find a cure for. Where here in the West you have medicine, you can go to, you can go to a doctor and know that you will be looked after. But it's like it's um it's being in um in a state of poverty that's killing. And so it's a prayer that is prayed for survival on that day. Uh, the other one that I can think of that people have talked about would be um, Psalm 23 of, um, of understanding the 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 element of really being in the shadow of death. Not as a, you know, a spiritual kind of thinking, but as a reality, the realities of it is death can be at any time, whether from um, disease or from uh, political threats, or from, yeah, so the context will lay heavily on, on the text. So it's like you begin with the context and then look at the text through the eyes of the context and then go back and until there is um, an empowerment that comes from it, that will lead to transformation of the reality. So always starting with what is in the here and now in our life first. Yes. Ultimately interpreting it and wrestling with the text until it brings communal transformation. Yes. Absolutely. What a great talk tonight. Thank you. I know that um, Zoom, you know, when you're talking to, to kind of black screens and you don't know how yeah. it's resonating, there's nothing harder than that. <laughs> but uh, uh, you, have, you have done a, a lot for us, given us a lot. Um, and I greatly appreciate you taking us um, on this journey of the Bible through Africa, but also asking these very important contemporary questions that now uh, we think about even with the Lord's Prayer. So thank you. Yes. Well, thank you very yes. much. I